Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Welcome to everyone on this blessed evening in the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Middle East Council on Global Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome all of you. It's been a good four years since we last hosted a Ramadan event, whether an iftar or a suhoor. So I'm especially delighted to see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of old friends, to restart a tradition that kept us together, brought us together as a community, and allowed us in the middle of these holy days to recognize many important facets of life that matter to all of us, being with family, being with friends, reflecting on life, introspecting about who we are and what we're doing, especially nowadays in the midst of a lot of instability, not too far away from us, both within the Middle East and outside. So I pray with all of you, and I recognize the holiness of these days for many faiths and traditions around the world, that we enjoy better days ahead of us, that we achieve some common understanding, and that we work together to improve human welfare, enhance our prosperity, and build a peaceful future for many generations of our families and friends and loved ones to come. Our program tonight is very light. It is designed to essentially keep us interested in substantive topics and issues that matter, and for which we've assembled a very interesting group of individuals who will speak about activism, the importance of activism, the role of activism. It's a group who will engage in a discussion that you will hopefully find useful. It will be moderated by one of our fellows, Dr. Mark Owen Jones from HBKU, and with the participation of some fantastic panelists who will come to the podium in a few minutes. Other than this, I welcome you all and I invite you to enjoy the program, to spend time with us, to enjoy the suhoor, and to stay for the evening for as long as your time permits. Thank you very much again for coming and being with us. We look forward to your continued participation in future events, for which there will be plenty, both at our offices and also outside. We're back as an institution. Uh, Doha is thriving and looking forward to a better, brighter, and bigger future, and we plan to be a part of it, making a small contribution in our own space of public policy and international affairs. With this, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mark Owen Jones and the panelists for tonight's program. Please enjoy, and I'll be talking to you later, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Well, firstly, thank you very much for coming. 
It's lovely to be here on a beautiful evening and to see so many familiar and unfamiliar faces uh, who hopefully will be more familiar by the end of this. Um, okay. Someone's rustling. I don't think it's me. Um, so I am uh, Marco and Jones, and I am a fellow at Omega. And I am honored to be sharing the stage with such a, uh, an amazing, talented panel um, who will be speaking to you about youth activism in the MENA region, but also their own work and their own incredible contributions to the creative industries. Now, this is such an important panel for many reasons, but not least because of the sheer number of young people in the Middle East. In fact, about a quarter of the region is between the ages of 15 and 29. Uh, and what better way to actually discuss the issues confronting the youth in the region than having a panel of young people who are engaged in the cultural industries at the forefront of some of the issues that are really defining what young people are facing in the MENA region today. So we'll be talking about activism, but key, we'll also be talking about the real role of creativity, the importance of creativity in activism. And to do that, I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers, uh, whose bios I have here. And they are very impressive, so the bios will be quite long. And I will also allow them to introduce, introduce themselves in their own terms as well. So on uh, my left and your right is uh, Mariam El Adabhani, who's a journalist and a filmmaker. Uh, Mariam is a Yemeni-Russian award-winning journalist, a filmmaker, curator, an educator based in Mina, in Qatar, yeah. uh, a two-time TEDx speaker, and a pioneer in using virtual reality <coughs> to highlight stories from Yemen. al Dabhani earned her bachelor's degree in journalism and strategic communication from Northwestern University in 2019, and a postgraduate diploma in museum and gallery practice from University College London in 2020. She has received numerous awards for her films, including Most Promising Filmmaker, at the 2019 Toronto Arab Film Festival for a film in the middle. Through her work, al Dabhani aims to challenge the stereotyping of the MENA region in mainstream media and promote a message of equality in humanity. Her debut feature, Let's Play Soldiers, is part of the Close-Up Initiative. And she has provided mentorship and training to young filmmakers in conflict areas, including Yemen and Libya. Currently, she serves as a consultant on a Hollywood production film about Yemen. Um, and on Mariam's left is Mohammed al Qasabi, <coughs> who's an inventor uh, and the winner of the Education Excellent Award in Qatar. Mohammed is a Qatari information scientist, inventor, and entrepreneur currently working as a senior security data scientist at Qatar Energy. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar with a major in information systems. Al Qasabi received the Platinum Award at Education Excellence Day from His Highness the Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani in 2023. Congratulations. <laughs> Al Qasabi's innovation in the offside detection system placed third at the 13th season of Stars of Science and fifth at the Challenge and Innovation Forum in Qatar of 2021. Again, as you can see, the impressive achievements are accumulating as we go down. And there we have Sara Hermes, founder and director of Creative Space Beirut. Sara is a Lebanese and Armenian fashion designer, director, and educator raised in Kuwait. Hermes graduated from the Parsons School of Design at the New School, where she double majored in fashion design and media studies. Hermes is the founder and director of Creative Space Beirut, a three year tuition free fashion school for promising young designers in Lebanon. Its graduates are already rising names in the industry, including Rani Halwa, who won the Fashion Trust Arabia War in 2019, and Ahmed Azhar, who was selected to be part of the Maison de la Mode incubator in Marseille. Amazing. And last but certainly not least, Othman Khanji, an interdisciplinary conceptual artist. Othman is an interdisciplinary conceptual artist who has lived in Bahrain, Dubai, Colombia, and Qatar. His work ranges across the fields of product and interactive installation design, Khonji received a master's in fine arts and design studies from Virginia Commonwealth University. Othman is a VCU 10 under 10 award-winning artist and a certified member of the Sapri Bridge Oriental Design Week. Uh, Fioris Salone co-founder of Asia Design Pavilion at Milan Design Week and an official member of the Milan Fioris Salone Commission. He has worked with local and international organizations such as Studio Banana, 
That's not a typo, right? That's cool. <laughs> Studio Banana, Virginia Commonwealth University, Brown University, King's College of London, French House of Design, and Clatara Museums. I definitely want to hear more about Studio Banana when it comes to it, OK? <laughs> so as you can see, an incredibly talented uh, and, um, um, well, inspiring uh, panel. Um, and I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves in their own words. Tell us a bit about yourself in your own words, what you do, and, if you can, what role you think activism plays in some of the pressing issues facing youth in the MENA region. So, Mariam, over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I don't know if this is working, or maybe I should yeah, it's working. make it a bit longer. Um, so, thank you so much for your kind words and the introduction. Um, I moved to Doha in 2015, at the beginning of the war in Yemen. And I kind of restarted my education, including um, having the chance to study film. So I'm a filmmaker by passion, and by, of course, the Doha Film Institute's support. So what I decided to do is being in a safe space where my hometown, my family, every, everyone and everything I knew wasn't OK. How can I give back? I'm not a politician. I don't have any of that power, but I can tell stories, or at least I learned that I can tell stories. And the power of telling stories of owning our own narrative as people from the area rather than someone else parachuting and telling it for us. So the idea of Let's Play Soldiers that you'll see a clip for, uh, from in a, in a moment. And the idea was, how do we change the narrative on Yemen? Um, I had a residency in Germany as part of my studies at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. And my, the director of the space at that time, when she was thinking of having portraits of children around the world, when it came to Yemen, she, without thinking, said, oh, child soldiers, like it was nothing, like it was something very normal. Mm -hmm. For me, it wasn't. I'm, I'm from there, this is my home. We have much more than the destruction that you see within the, um, the news. We're not the worst man-made you know, humanitarian crisis only, period. We're not a place that is unlivable, period. There are people there who are trying to survive, just like in many other areas. So that was kind of a portrait of kids telling their own stories. Why do they join the front lines? It's not because they want to kill someone on the other side. It's not an act of patriotism, as many people think. It's because they, ha they need a mean to provide for themselves and their families. Mm. And what do they think about it? What is their point of view instead of being pointed <clears throat> at and saying, this is what they want to say, this is a platform for them to share what is happening on, on, on the ground. Um, and I'm trying to work on an impact strategy along with the film. So, Telling stories means spreading awareness about what is happening from the point of view of the people living there. But what do we give back? As journalists or filmmakers, we try not to interfere within the environment we're filming, but how do we balance it out with the ethics of how can I help even on a minimal scale? So working on an impact of how do we change within that small village started with the idea of training young people from the village itself to learn how to hold the boom, how to record audio, how to film by themselves. and they, the classical educational system is failing these kids. They're escaping from school first, and then they're joining the front lines. Mm -hmm. So by having an alternative mean of learning, and then as a way of providing replacing guns with cameras is kind of a first step. If we can replicate that within that village that we're filming in, and then locally within Yemen, that's already a huge difference that we can make within the, on the ongoing conflict, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just before you show your clip, I'd just like to ask, I mean, Obviously, you're doing amazing work with people living in Yemen and, and trying to make that work sustainable. But at the same time, I imagine you see, how do you see the long-term prospects for a lot of these young people that you work with? Um, unfortunately, the war doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. So how can we provide safe spaces for these kids not to feed in within the war machine because the war feeds itself mm. and it becomes profitable to some people that would like to maintain it that way. So how do we change that and, and have something kind of counter, counter it in a way? Mm. How do we bring these kid, kids back from the front lines and giving them the alternative to find a decent living, a way to provide, so we break that machine from within? Right, right. Cool. right now, I would like to, us to go over to, to Mohammed. Um, if you could, again, introduce <coughs> yourself, tell us a bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mark, for the great introduction. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian, and Barak alaikum, Matabagam al Shahar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, I'm an information systems graduate from Carnegie Mellon University, as Mark mentioned earlier, and currently working at Qatar Energy with the cybersecurity team. 
and also the head of robotics and AI department at Qatar Scientific Lab. I'm also a football player. Uh, I remember a few years ago we had an important match in the semifinals against Arayan. It was such a tough game. And we lost that game because, I think, because of a wrong offside call by the referee. So I was really mad and I started shouting on the referee, it's offside, please. But uh, at the same time, I can't blame the referee because it's hard for referees to take accurate decisions in uh, some cases. So I started doing some research on how we can solve this problem and help referees take more accurate decisions using the tool of technology. And that's when I invented uh, OPAS, which is a smart system that detects offside violations accurately during the game uh, by notifying the referee uh, using the smartwatch in case of any uh, offside violation. It also analyzes the player's performances during the game and injuries in case they happen. And I've recently won the third best Arab inventor in terms of science and the fifth best inventor on the award in the CIF. And at that time, when I first had the idea, I had no uh, tech background. Uh, I was just a student in high school and a football player. But uh, I think football was the motive why I uh, entered the field of technology. So I saw how powerful uh, football is as a tool. And that's when I joined Generation Amazing Foundation as an ambassador. And Generation Amazing, we use football as a tool for development. We use uh, football as a tool to empower youth to uh, uh, achieve some of the SDGs, raise awareness, and uh, create uh, social change. We focus more on uh, refugees and community clubs in more than 75 countries now. <coughs> and we've built several community clubs in these countries to help uh, empower youth uh, in several ways using the tool of football. And uh, since I've been uh, uh, active in the youth uh, field, <coughs> I have also been uh, a youth advocate with the Education Above All Foundation, where I've, because when, when being in the field of youth and seeing all the challenges that uh, youth face, uh, I think we can create change by participating in several events. I've been participating in local and international uh, events that are related to SDGs and social change, including the Youth Assembly in the UN. And yeah, I think this is a brief introduction about what I do. Uh, thank you. And I really want to hear more about what Generation Amazing are doing uh, with regards to the youth in the region. But I saw a photo with uh, David Beckham. Uh, yes, this was in Generation Amazing uh, Festival. So Generation Amazing also have uh, several ambassadors, okay. mostly football players uh, so around the world. You can dish the dirt, David Beckham. He's, is he a nice guy or not? Yeah, he is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, Sara, could you uh, tell us a bit about yourself and about your work? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I'm Sara Hermes. Um, I'm one of the founders of Creative Space Beirut. So Creative Space Beirut is a social enterprise, and at the heart of what we do is we have a tuition-free school for fashion design. So we search for students across Lebanon between the ages of 16 and 25 who dream to be fashion designers but can't afford it. Um, so it's a three-year uh, curriculum. Uh, the students come every day from Monday to Friday, and we have course, technical courses like pattern making, construction, design development, creative courses, uh, textile design development, 3D digital design, uh, the history of fashion. So it's a full, well-rounded curricul curriculum. And within the technical and creative education, we also have experiential learning. This is because we really try to provide a reality education, because it's so important when our students graduate for them to be able to um, work in the industry, to be able to find jobs, and to have careers. So for example, we collaborate with different brands. They, we provide them with internships. And when they graduate, we provide them with a sort of net network so they can uh, have work opportunities. Uh, some of our alumni have gone on to launch their own brands. So one of our students, as you had mentioned, uh, Roni Hado, he won the Fashion Trust Arabia Award, and he's actually here today. And uh, we have other designers who launched their brands. Some of them are working, uh, have been hired within design institutions, and they're teaching. So uh, the success rates, we, we only accept 10 students a year in the three-year program, so it's very intensive, but the success rate is very high, and, and our students graduate to enter the industry themselves. They also come back and they teach the new students, so they teach at the school, and they collaborate with the school as well. So the ecosystem that we're developing is training, it's uh, education, but it's work opportunity, and it's also collaboration. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, our, our mission is free education and fostering talent, 
and you, you asked in, in terms of the importance <clears throat> of creativity and, and activism. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, especially in a country like Lebanon today, where we're going through a complete economic crisis, where we, we lack government or any sort of support from basic needs like electricity and water, you know, having a space uh, for creatives to come to that, that is, you know, it has electricity, it has internet, it has mentorship, it has equipment, a space where creative people can come together to to do to continue to do what they love to do to to be able to continue to to have hope and to dream i mean it's it's so important and i think in times of crisis it's even more important because it allows people especially creative people to continue to to be able to dream towards a future yeah. as opposed to just survive Absolutely. and and i think that, that that's mandatory actually I, I, I mean you mentioned there was 10, 10 people a year i mean i presume if, if you could you'd expand that number right but of course i mean i mean resources it's 10 people a year because we yeah. really believe in um working very closely with the students to be able yeah. to make sure that we're we're you know providing the right education but of course if if we're you know we would love to scale and grow um mm. as time comes so what makes us a social enterprise is we've also launched um a brand called yeah. CSB, which is, I mean, at the end of the day, we're designers. So if designers can come together to produce items and sell the items, then that's a way of sustainability. Yeah. So we still rely on grants, uh, on the grant system and, and donors and individuals to give scholarships to the program. But the, the dream in, uh, for the future is to be able to sustain the school through the sales of our brand. Mm. And uh, we've also launched an online store called csbworld.com. So we have um, different avenues that we're working towards building to reach self-sustainability. And um, our mission at the, and our vision essentially is to be able to have a sort of uh, campus where we can expand the model into other creative uh, models, you know, from visual yeah. arts to architecture, graphic design, whatever it may be. Because the creative industry is a really, really important industry, and it's, um, it, I mean, I, there's just so much potential. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah and it's weird. and it's a great thing, Ronnie here. Who, <laughs> congratulations, by the way, on winning the prize. But how, how did you come up with this idea, though? I mean. Um, so, essentially, at, at, it, it started as a passion project. So, yeah. um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm Lebanese, but uh, I grew up in Kuwait, and yeah. I went to school in uh, New York, and I was studying fashion design at Parsons, but I was also studying um, media and culture studies, and I did a few study abroad programs where I went to uh, Dharamsala, and I studied Tibetan politics, and mm -hmm. I went to Cambodia for a while and studied that, and it was those experiences that basically changed the way that I viewed the world and the work that I wanted to do. And I knew that I didn't want to do fashion design just for the sake of selling clothes. And I wanted yeah. to find a way to merge my passions, which is creativity and social justice. Yeah. And I decided to go to Lebanon because I'm Lebanese and I never lived in Lebanon before. And there's so much work to be done there. So why not do it there? Um, and so yeah, so, so this is essentially the combination of both. And I was sitting with them. Um, with my mentor at the time from Parsons and telling her about all the things I want to do. And she's like, you know, why don't you start a school? And I was 23 at the time. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend the rest of my life <laughs> building a school. <laughs> and, of and course, I didn't know what that was uh -huh. at the time. But um, I mean, I think sometimes you know, starting initiatives at a young age and when you're naive, it allows you to take uh, risks yeah. and jump into things without knowing too much. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, that's why I did a PhD. I but I mean, again, I mean, it's it's amazing that I mean, so it's, you're doing entrepreneur work and and, and and in the creative industries in, in a very difficult situation right now. Really incredible. Thanks. Last but not least, though, again, I keep saying that because, well, you are at the end right and you're really far away. <laughs> but uh, Othman, again, tell us about your work, who you are, and again, how you think your work or or your creativity is important um, for youth activism in the region. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, as he had introduced earlier, uh, very graciously, all of us. Um, so it was, you made it easy. I, what can I say? You <laughs> made it easy. <laughs> my name is Athman Khanji. Um, I'm from Bahrain. I've been here for almost 10 years now. I'm an artist. I'm an educator. Um, I'll start off this, uh, this segment by saying um, I, as a kid, grew up uh, always aiming to change furniture in my room wanting to do something creative, had a lot of different thoughts, uh, wanted to take part in workshops and, and talks and so on. But I was always told that um, seeing that field from a male perspective, someone from the Gulf region, is either a non-masculine field or a field that um, is maybe a non-money-making field, let's say, career-wise, and to look elsewhere, you know, either be a doctor, a lawyer, and so on. And, like, and, and history repeats itself. So. 
um, from someone who had had such an upbringing to um, then after years of studying different majors, uh, coming to what exactly I wanted from the very beginning, if only I had you know, certain advocates who pushed me in the right direction, encouraged me, um, I would have maybe, let's not even say that because you know, you, we each have our personal journeys, but so saying that, I am proud today to say that part of what I do is, um, is be a very strong advocate for the youngsters, for the upcoming generations. Um, uh, during the day, I'm a, I'm a counselor, a senior recruitment specialist at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I think I've come full circle when I say this. Um, and generally, I'm an artist. Uh, I graduated from Virginia Commonwealth. Uh, I teach at both VCU and also UDST, University of Doha Science and Technology. Uh, sometimes these acronyms can. <laughs> so, um, so being an artist, creating certain artworks, which I'm hoping you'd see one or two on the screen, uh, basically having that um, passion to want to create something, to basically create change, um, inspire, is something that lives within me. And, um, and being someone who was that kid one day, uh, I face a lot of these small, you know, different, you know, let's say incidents that happen that really trigger um, personal moments in my life that make me want to just, you know, aside from being a job, but to be a career. There's a very, there's a big difference between those words. And I do that passionately. I do it, you know, it comes from the heart where I'll have moments, for example, where um, I'll give info sessions or, or um, presentations at different you know, schools or universities. And I've had moments, um, I'll give one or two examples, that um, some students here, uh, let's say male students, would wait until the counselors leave or wait until their, their you know, classmates leave to actually ask me whether they want to study fashion design. They can't do that in front of the rest of their peers. or their, their, And that says something about, you know, where we are, what we do, and, uh, and just to maybe listen for a change. Um, so these are different artworks. Uh, this was created, for example, for the uh, Women in War exhibit in Kuwait. Um, and uh, it, it did talk about the injustice of you know, how uh, women had to go through those psychological um, um, periods and, and how I wanted to empower women in a different way uh, and instead of showing weakness, but to actually show um, show them as, as, as strong, even through what they had to thrive through. And uh, so basically it's, uh, it's a 3D printed sculpture which talks about um, the idea of, um, in my opinion, uh, women are the second in line as, as icons of creation, uh, and, um, and without them we'd be threatened, basically our race would be threatened. So hence this uh, artwork was created to show the two ends of the spectrum to have something that it, it depicts the, the essence of purity, let's say, which is a fetus, and then um, the opposite, let's say, extreme, which is a weapon destruction, and how, you know, whether it's a soldier in war, whether it's, a, it's someone who's in charge of a country, let's say, they would um, think twice that this on the receiving end could be their mother, could be their daughter, could be their sister, and how would you feel if it becomes personal? So yeah, each and every one of my artworks uh, kind of uh, depict coming from a place of always wanting to be an advocate for the, for the creatives. Um, there was another artwork also that, that showed, which was basically, uh, it's I think what triggered my whole career at Virginia Commonwealth. It, uh, it was called the Prairie. It's basically a mechanical praying mat that from physical praying leads to a mobile tangible outcome, which is uh, rosaries. Um, so from Salah to Tisbih. And um, I was, my background's interior, I, I've studied interior architecture, and uh, in my MFA program at VCU, I went into interactive design and product, and that's where I realized that um, that specific artwork triggered my whole, let's say, career. And I was lucky enough, alhamdulillah, that when I graduated, I was gonna head back to Bahrain. Uh, I, I had several opportunities, like getting a job at Qatar Museums to start with, before what I do today. And uh, for one of my artworks, which triggered the whole collection, uh, was acquired by Her Excellency Sheikh Al Mayasa. And I didn't really believe for a moment there that um, this was happening because um, I wasn't brought up to say, I'm an artist, I can create something and it could sell, I could make money out of that industry. But here I am, you know, having someone like that believe in me. Um, and, and I'm from the Gulf. Uh, as, a, as a male Khaliji, it's not something that I would ever have 
thought or believed that could happen. And then to come full circle once again to mention that to today be an advocate for, for youngsters who want that um, and, and need that push in the right direction, need someone to tell them that they could be everywhere. And, and this is a fantastic example right here next to me. So this is you know, what, we, what I try to do, let's say, um, through what I, and, and I really enjoy it. I, I feel very passionate. And alhamdulillah, we have a lot of success stories. Um, I'm happy to share a lot of our amazing alums who are in Qatar and abroad. Mm. I mean, I, I hope everyone had a chance to see some of those artworks that Arthman explained. I just wanted a, a quick question. I mean, do you get a sense of how your work is received? Because I know you produce these amazing sculptures, for example. I mean, what opportunities do you get to actually see how people react to those? Um, interesting question. Um, each artwork is very different, to be very honest. You know, some of them are more about education, like the, the prayer, um, the mechanical praying mat. That's definitely just to encourage the youngsters um, to, for example, in that specific artwork, to want to pray and not have to. There's a lot of power in that. There's, there's a lot of the idea of us being brought up and not understanding really what we're doing as a ritual, um, as opposed to just following a tradition or a culture or a ritual. Uh, so with that, it's maybe more on the lines of something people would really enjoy and be inspired by. Mm. Um, that specific artwork actually uh, is what triggered pretty much my whole career because when I shot that, uh, we, we had a video of, of the prairie artwork in uh, uh, the Grand Mosque here in Qatar. And I had the, the head of the Grand Mosque approached me because we were filming the piece there. And uh, he said, um, explain what it is, and I did. And uh, I was, to be honest, I was a little, um, I was a bit afraid because this is Sheikh Malal al Jabbar, who's the head of the Grand Mosque. And I'm here as an as a art student wanting to explain a project. And uh, I did, and he said, we have an upcoming festival in Katara for kids, and can you produce two smaller versions? I was during my thesis year, so I wouldn't have been able to, but the idea of someone like him being very interested in this, in this piece that is a contraption created opened up like doors for me, you know, just to, to think that there's a lot of potential, like Sarah said. Um, and um, yet, to tackle your question from a different perspective of some of the more maybe thought-provoking or maybe provocative artworks, let's say, uh, some of them are political, uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes, yes, you, you will get some backlash. Yeah. Um, yet, as long as you um, justify what you do as I said earlier, it comes from the heart. I know what I'm doing. I do everything for the right reasons. Uh, I pick every material to feed into my concept. So that changes the game because when they ask that question, um, when you know what you're going to say and you justify it, it changes the game. Um, I'll give a small example. I had a, <clears throat> I had this, uh, not to mention who that is, but uh, this woman who approached me on, um, on social media, actually not me directly, she actually approached another platform called Connecting Arts. And it's a platform here in Qatar uh, that started, and they, they really empower a lot of youngsters <coughs> to showcase their art abroad. And uh, they had reposted one of my artworks that was quite controversial. I'm not sure if it's showing today on the screen, but um, um, she basically said, like, who gives you the right? Who are you, like, as a, as a you know, are you a religious counselor? Uh, how do you, why do you say what you're saying? And of course this was specific. And I had never known on Instagram that you were able to post this one that's on the screen right now, to post such like a long post. I never knew you could actually post that much until I saw that post from her. Mm -hmm. But um, I took two days, it digested, I responded and I said, um, this is what it's supposed to mean. Yes, it is a very thought provoking piece that talks about like how religion and culture might depict a woman's place in our society. So once again, bear in mind what the topic is, but as a male to be talking about it, I could see how that could really you know, yeah. um, push some buttons. But she, um, she came back and said that she apologized, and now I have her as an ally. Whenever I have a project, I go to her. So it prompted a dialogue. I Definitely. Mean, I, think that's, I think that's a really interesting point. Definitely. I think that's what <clears throat> art should do, right? Um, Definitely. Prompt those discussions. So yeah, I mean, thank you for those incredible inter introductions. I mean, as you can see, we've got people with background in film, football, fashion, fine art. I thought really hard about getting <laughs> the alliteration there, right? Um, but you're young people, and you all work with young people in different ways, right? So both as young people and with the people you work with, I, I, I'd like to know what kind of 
sense of the challenges you see young people facing in the region? Firstly, what challenges do you think they face? Because you all, whilst you have different backgrounds, you also have focused on different countries from different perspectives. So what challenges do you see young people facing? And how do you think what you do in particular helps address those challenges? Mariam, if you, if you could yeah, answer uh, that. That's a fantastic question. Sorry, it's a very it's a ambitious. But no, no, it is, it is very important <coughs> to talk about this because from the perspective of filmmaking and cinema, for example, we lack proper cinema education in the region, not only in Yemen, let's say Libya, let's say other places. Yeah. Um, even here in Doha, we don't have cinema or filmmaking degree. It's just a few classes that you can steal here and there, or a course you can take in, in, in Doha Film Institute. But you don't have it as a proper full degree okay. with the access to all the tools that you need to be able to tell, yeah. you know, to tell your own narrative or the films that you want to, to tell. And another issue is also lack of, of grants and support. We have very limited possibilities of doing that, especially if you're an expat in, <coughs> in another country. I don't know, Saudi has so much with the Red Sea, but right. it's not accessible for everyone equally. Um, so what I'm trying to do, for example, me, myself, I uh, kind of echo what uh, Osman was saying. I, I Initially, I studied pharmaceutical studies back in Yemen for my dad, because it's either a doctor or an doctor, engineer, right, or yeah. you're wasting your life. Right. So I, I, <coughs> I decided to please my dad at the beginning, up until the war. I almost graduated, but I couldn't. Wow. And then moving here to Doha, I got a chance of restart and study journalism, which is something I was passionate yeah. about at, at Northwestern. Um, but again, it, it wasn't within what I wanted. I wanted to do filmmaking as well. That wasn't obtainable at, at the point that, uh, that I was studying there. And it's so difficult that you're passionate about something you don't have the means to study it that delays you being able to do it for yeah, years. Yeah. Um, so what I'm trying to do from the opportunities I get, I teach, I educate, I do trainings, especially to, to my home, <coughs> to Yemen, when I do it in collaboration with, for example, the New York Film Academy. And what we did in, in one of the people who helped me in the film in the village that I'm filming, he got a certificate from the New York Film Academy. Okay which is, was unobtainable in, in any other way, but online, a bit of COVID effect, because COVID pushed us to do things online. People from places, remote villages in Yemen, got to have that access and that education that was unimaginable before. Mm. So we're trying to do Lego, build up on the little experience they have, passing it on, yeah. and then it grows with them. Yeah, I mean, it's an educational, you're, you're obviously, providing, again, these skills or training, training, which is valuable in itself. <coughs> but do you think the actual art of creating film is also important in terms of, I mean, you mentioned earlier how lots, when Yemen is represented, it's done by outsiders, and, and, and this can give people a very one-dimensional view. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's also important in actually Extremely. Extremely. Cultural production from the region. So even the way the region is kind of projected in Hollywood, how are we projected? We're monodimensional, we're savages. You've got that filter on the screen, exactly. the, the yellow filter. And how you know, do like we the... counter that? How do we yeah. take back the narrative and how do we tell our own stories? We know with the situation with Qatar and the World Cup, the effect of you know Western media, yeah. the whole attack was unjustified, especially when people came here and experienced the culture, they were able to say through social media, this is not true, I'm here, mm. this is not what is happening. And that's a small scale storytelling through social media. How about if we own a narrative that accesses TV, <coughs> Netflix, that affects people's mindset, but also the generations growing up. We, yeah. uh, for example, millennials at least, yeah. we grew up watching certain series, let's say Friends, for example, and it affected how we think and how we interact. Right. So imagine if there is no representation of me and how I look like and my culture, then I lose that aspect of myself. How do I regain it? Yeah. How I get it back is by telling my story myself. Yeah, and giving or well, helping others have the power to be able to tell exactly, the story. Exactly, hundred percent. But you know, I just when you actually you know work with uh, these young people, do they express their own concerns about how they see the future? I mean, yeah, what's the picture like? Um, so many things. For them, because of the effect of the NGOs, they end up telling stories from one narrative of charity, for example. Right. I need to tell the story of X space because X NGO is giving me funding to tell that specific story. Mm. But maybe I want to tell a story about my grandfather, right. or I want to tell a story about this certain type of food that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I want to share that part of who I am in my culture because it's part of my identity. Yeah. But I don't have space to tell that because to people, to the world, it's not important. There are other urgent matters, which is true. Yeah, of course, yeah. But then how do you allow people to see themselves more than that dark box of death, misery, 
and continuous yeah. hopelessness if you don't allow us to show our full colors and full dimensions and be human to you. Right. And unfortunately, we have to say that, human, because we've been dehumanized on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, thank you. And, and Mohammed, you also work with young people and, and um, <coughs> with, with football, Generation Amazing, yes. right? I mean, do you work in the region? Uh, in the region and uh, abroad, yes. Okay. I mean, could you give it some examples of, for example, some of the projects that you worked on? And what, what, what does Generation see their role as in terms of how does it see football helping the youth? Or, or yeah. is that what, how it sees itself? So before talking about Generation Amazing, I have uh, a short story. Oh. So when I first started working, uh, or when I first had the idea of my invention, uh, yeah. I had zero technical background. Okay. So I, I did not have the resources to help me to convert this theoretical idea into reality. So I started seeking some help from different institutions, but I think I was kind of underestimated because of my young age. Okay. And then when I did some more research, I found that it's not only me. Many youth uh, are facing the same issue, uh, especially <coughs> when dealing with bigger institutions. You mean being underestimated? Kind of, yes. Yeah. Uh, and one example is when you go to universities and see a bunch of senior projects that are really good, they tackle real uh, problems and solve them. But once they are represented and uh, being awarded, خلاص, they will go back and stay in the university and right. never go back, never go uh, uh, out of uni. Mm -hmm. So I started working with a group of my friends uh, on, an, on a platform that can link between researchers and inventors and the institutions that can support their uh, projects and uh, make them happen. Yeah. So this was one way that uh, uh, I've been working on is using technology as a tool to solve some of the issues that we face uh, as uh, young people. <laughs> what Generation Amazing uh, does is that they use football as a tool to uh, raise awareness to uh, uh, make people more aware about the SDGs and the importance of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals to uh, uh, achieve social change. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a group of uh, refugees, I think, in Syria. Uh, they were football players, and they did uh, a movie, the Zatari, I'm not sure if you know it. It's also on, on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been, adopt they've been uh, uh, supported by Generation Amazing and other institutions uh, in Qatar. And also there, are, there were other refugees who were also using football in their own communities. And then they uh, started playing in Brazil. And now they are uh, football players at Lucille Sports Club. Mm -hmm. And all the collaboration uh, mm -hmm. happened with Generation Amazing by hosting uh, several workshops, using football, and also uh, creating some community clubs in different countries. And most importantly, because uh, you can't theoretically uh, explain the social problems that are happening to uh, young people, so because they use football that people are passionate about, especially the young generation, as a tool. And they also use uh, ambassadors, uh, big football players, big names like David Beckham, Kafu, yeah. Ali Al-Habsi, and many other names, uh, to be inspired by them, by this uh, generation. So when they see uh, football and big names, uh, big football names, they will be more motivated. And then when you use it as a tool to uh, raise awareness and achieve the social change, I think it uh, have a bigger uh, impact. Yeah, and and again, I, the, the same question as asked Mariam is when you speak to some of the the, the the youth you work with, I mean, how do they see the future, and what kind of challenges do they see? A few years ago, they were complaining more, okay. but I believe uh, today uh, we're seeing uh, the changes happening now. Uh, yeah. Maybe not in a fast pace, okay. but I believe it's happening, and step by step, I think we can have a brighter future, inshallah. Okay, thank you. And Sara, I mean, I, you, you've already alluded to some of the challenges that you face, especially in Lebanon at the moment, moment that I'm sure many people are aware of. Um, but what would you say some of the biggest challenges you see facing young people, either in the region or in, in Lebanon in particular? Um, I mean, specifically in Lebanon, because yeah. in terms of the work that we're doing, it's right now targeting, uh, I mean, existing in Lebanon. Um, when you say existing, you mean just day to day? Yeah, and yeah. like the, the the social enterprise as a whole is currently focused in Lebanon. Hopefully, yeah. we will expand, and that's the goal. But for now, we are focused in Lebanon. And um, I mean, the 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 root of of why we began in Lebanon in the first place is because there was a need for it. It's right. The fact, and and now more than ever, there's a bigger need because I mean, even the educational sector in Lebanon is collapsing. So, right. um, quality education is more important than ever. Um, so in terms of challenges, you know, I always say it's like you take five steps forward and 20 steps back in Lebanon and like 10 steps forward and then yeah. 30 steps back. So you're always, you know, in this like back and forth situation. 
Um, you know, for example, in the case of Creative Space Beirut in 2019, we had uh, signed a partnership with a foundation based in Switzerland called the Drosos Foundation. Mm. And the whole uh, goal was to help scale and grow the social enterprise. But then come 2019, there are the uprisings, and then there's the pandemic, and of course there's the Beirut port explosion, which essentially um, our school was located in the center. So the oh, really? school got destroyed and we had to rebuild the entire thing. So. This funding that we got to scale and grow essentially went back to rebuild everything that we've been building in the last 10 years to basically start again. And so there is this aspect of, you know, the, I guess the challenge of, of Lebanon is, is the, the, the challenge of, you know, to keep going, essentially. Right. And um, I mean, I think not to sit and like, I mean, this is life and that's what it is to be in Lebanon. So it's, it's not to sit and like, you know, get depressed over that. It's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of beauty that comes with it as well is that, you know, the beauty of, of uh, community or the, the drive and like once these, what, why, like I was saying earlier, like why these spaces are so important is because when these spaces do exist, you see, you know, the, the it's, it's just filled with community. Everybody wants to participate from the instructors to the, to, to the, the community that we're building and the students, you know, the students are so active. They all have uh, access to the space 24 hours. So they're, they're, they're involved all the time. They're, there's so much drive, so much passion, you know, be it when we have exhibitions or fashion shows, they're working backstage. Um, there's constant collaboration and constant energy. Um, so this part doesn't die and this part is right. what needs to keep going. And I think that I know what we've discovered in the last five years is that um, you know the tuition-free school needs to continue to exist in Lebanon, and the, the the building of the community needs to continue to exist there. But because there is no more market there, it's important to find ways to expand. Mm -hmm. And um, how do how, how do you ex I mean, how does that happen? With I mean, be it take this ecosystem and yeah. and find ways regionally to to ad adapt and build you know other creative space Beiruts within the region. Yeah be it through the workshop program um, or just to, to, to have a similar model elsewhere. Um, you know, I think that's the only, um, I mean, I think, I think that's the only way to really make it work. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, that's why also being here, you know, thank you for inviting me here because being here and like, finding ways to access in, in terms of collaborations and partnerships is something that's so important. I mean, Creative Space Bidu always functions through collaborations and partnerships in the first place. Right. So, I mean, this sort of, um, you know, coming out here and exposing what we do is something that's very important for us. Well, I mean, Mariam also touched on this notion of, like, resources and support, you know. I mean, what do you, what kind of support is that for, for endeavors like yours? Uh, obviously, I know in, 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 in Lebanon, the, the economic situation is not good. So how, how do yeah, you survive, essentially? And how do um, uh, endeavors like yours survive? Because often yeah, when there's tough. economic crisis, right? <laughs> Like the first things to go are funding to arts and, and yeah. humanities. One hundred percent. I mean, now it's because you're sort of in emergency relief, which yeah. obviously is so <clears throat> important, especially after the explosion. Of course, yeah. Because I mean, you're you're rebuilding the country. Sure. Um, but I mean, sustainability is something that's so important for the growth of the country. I mean, we're yeah. talking about the creative industry. I mean, that's again one of the most important industries in the world. I mean, this is where job opportunities and livelihoods are created. Of so um, it's something that has to also be as important. I mean, it's different, but it's, it's important. So um, yes, funding is less, and yeah. it's, it's a huge struggle. Um, but there are organizations that are still funding. And I mean, it's a struggle. I don't know what to say. You know, this is one of our biggest challenges. Uh, we're very lucky also in terms of um, and one of our ways in term, uh, is through individual scholarships. So individuals that believe in our mission of free education also give scholarships to our students. So that's one way that we do it. Right, well. While we're building our sustainability plan, which is our brand and our online store. Right. Um, during the pandemic, for example, we adapted and we, we, we basically turned our school into a production house for, uh, for PPE, so production equipment yeah, yeah. for hospitals. Okay. Yeah. So we started to produce uh, isolation gowns. We started to produce masks. So we went into this whole production mode which was a great experience for our students because all of a sudden I mean it was like the apocalypse we went from like a fashion school to all of a sudden working with doctors and hospitals and coming up with gear for them to basically survive and um, so that experience was also a, a learning experience for our students as well so, yeah. okay okay sorry yeah no um, I mean I, I I find it fascinating that you're making is that because you had to help with the the capacity because you only had you have ten people, right? We have it's a three year program. Ah, so you have ten at a time. Ah, okay, right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean it's to keep going. I mean, we, you're constantly. This is the, also the 
thing about being in Lebanon. It's like you're constantly adapting to the situation. So I mean, when the pandemic happened, it was like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever, pandemic. So adapt. And uh, yeah, we became like a, a production house specifically for that, which was a great way to survive at the time. Um, so yeah. I mean, again, <laughs> inspirational. Um, Ahmed, you mentioned um, again, you know, again, you, you, you speak to, to, to students, especially those who may be interested in pursuing either an arts degree or, or, or education in general. I mean, what kind of concerns do you, do you think uh, young people going into education have? And, um, and, and what challenges do you think that they have or, or, or they, you see in, in their desire to kind of study uh, in the creative industries? Well, to start with, whether it's from the counselors from schools, whether yeah. it's parents or the students themselves, um, they worry about what their future would look like yeah. because it's a bit vague. Okay. Um, when it comes to pursuing anything to do with art, design, anything creative, as you can see, four of us here like, uh, yeah. give very different you know, perspectives on what art can be, what design, what creativity is. Um, so you can't really define it, um, yet it's integrated in our everyday lives. Um, look around you. We're all wearing clothes. We, what we read, what we look at, what we enjoy, it's integrated. And um, I guess... Uh, they worry about how their future would look like because it's it's not like you're studying medicine you'll end up in, in a in a hospital right. it doesn't work that way you could end up anywhere we have students at bars who graduate as art historians but today are um, in Doha Film Institute um, producing movies mm. so it really is that concern of wanting to know what the future would look like and um, it I would love to say they could be anything yeah, yeah. which it could but then that doesn't really help them so it is a bit of a, you know, a vague area where they, um, they need to be inspired, I guess, with different examples. And this is where both as an artist and an educator, um, whether as an artist, um, like Sarah was saying, a lot of collaboration, a lot of bringing students in. Every one of my solos, I'll have like the interior designed by our interior design students, um, curation done by like certain artists within painting and printmaking. So you encourage them by giving these these opportunities that are live in real life mm. before they graduate, or even sometimes as internships before they pursue any degree. Mm. So that's more of a safe zone where they haven't decided what they're going to study, but they get a glimpse of what it is. We do offer some uh, community development classes, for example, here in Doha at Virginia Commonwealth. So they do when you, have... Sorry, when you say community development, is that not formal <clears throat> degrees, but that's the... No, that okay. is, they're short courses right. that are very specific to different areas. Okay. And could be AI, could be, you know, like augmented reality, 3D design, 3D printing, yeah. um, interior design, it's totally up to them. Yeah. So it's a short course, a month, a month and a half, and that's about it, no yeah. commitment, not much of it. But, um, but yeah, so that as an artist, but as also as an educator, like I integrate a lot of different, you know, like I facilitate these um, experiences such as um, either, like one of the exercises I give them in class uh, in UDN, University of Doha, is because they're more, um, they're, they don't come from a creative background. A lot of them are doing like cybersecurity and everything pretty much. It's right. one of the larger universities here in, in Qatar. So um, for them to take my class and want to, you know, somehow, you know, show their creative side, they, one of the exercises I'd give them is like, okay, so you're, a, you're like a mini incubator or a company. You get to choose depending on your, you know, your interests, um, who's the conceptual person, who's gonna be the marketer, who's gonna be branding, who's gonna be um, production, who's gonna be the, the market itself, mm -hmm. you know, or the audience. And that would instigate a lot of really interesting conversations of how can you put together, how do you bring an idea to life? Yeah. Full, to see it full through from A to Z. Um, also, the idea of like another thing I teach is website design. Yeah. They, I tell them, this is not for me. I don't want you to design something that would make me happy, but design something that could help your career flourish. Okay. Like, how do you use, and like one of my uh, students was studying pharmaceuticals, and she ended up designing a website to better archive medication, and then sold it to, you know, the, the company that she was interning at. Yeah. So it's these little moments of like that you can do something. You can okay. really, you know, allow for that. And as youngsters, if you, they're only as good as a benchmark that you set for them. You right. know, so. But you, I mean, you, do you see like the the scene now in terms of speaking to a young person who wants to go into the creative industries as better than it was say five ten years ago? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that they, they, they see more opportunities in that space, or they can Definitely. convince their parents that there's opportunities <clears throat> in that space? Well, um, I'll have a parent that'll walk in. <laughs> With, with a very different perspective and yeah. leave after a good hour by saying the words, 
oh, I want to study here now. Oh, okay. Well, so it you enroll a lot of parents as well. <laughs> Definitely. And, and, and that's where, you know, you, you can, it's a game changer. It's up to you what you want to say. And like today, if I may share one, like two to three really good examples that people think that studying art or design is just, you know, either creating garments or painting. Right. But like a good example is um, one of a good friend and colleague, Bethane and Miftah. She designed the World Cup poster. She's going to go down in history yeah. as the content creator of what, you know, put out what the World Cup was to yeah. the world. Uh, we have, um, and of course, her, her work is in the National Museum. It's quite a big deal. But she also have, for example, um, Nisma Khudair. Nisma is the first, I like to use the word inventor and not designer, but she invented the first stringless guitar. So if any of you play guitar, imagine playing a guitar without strings. How would that feel? So like guitar it's fully sensor based, yeah, and it works even better. Oh wow! And another example is Patricia Dignan. She um, she started off a lot of her studies with like just um, working with. She was a fashion designer, yeah. and everyone expected something that would you know be fashion related. And she ended up doing all of her research in the in the medical field, and no one understood what was happening until she finally showcased her collection. And it was again maybe the word invented or enhanced. Uh, she um, she basically created the first uh, uh, enhanced lab coat for doctors. Okay. It was uh, don't quote me on this. I'm trying my best here, but uh, the it was made out of micro synthetic f uh, optic fiber that did not accumulate dust or germs. So imagine what a day to day of a doctor would yeah. look like. And then on a lot of other stuff like the sleeve had a flexible screen. The she noticed that the stethoscope was falling, and she made it magnetic. So it was definitely like an enhanced. And then it was tested in Sidra and John Hopkins. I mean, the, again, so, it, it highlights the, you know, the, often I think when people view the creative industries, and it, mm -hmm. it view it through a very narrow lens. So I think the examples you provided just show, like, and, and the, the examples everyone's provided shows kind of what a broad field it is, and, and, and that's amazing. And we have to wrap up soon. Unfortunately, we won't have time for Q&A, but I want to not put people on the spot. i just like each of you, if you could uh, indulge me in 30 seconds or less, if you could have one message for people here to go away with based on what you do, why you think it's important, what would it be? I'll give you like 10 seconds to have a think. <laughs> for the youth, you mean? Yeah. For the people here. Yeah, what, what message would you like them to go home thinking about? Listen. Apart from- Do some more listening. <laughs> I would say more listening. Oh, if more you have kids, if you are parents, um, or you have family members or friends, and they express, you know, anything to do with, you know, let's say, from in my case, the creatives. I'd say listen because each and every kid is different, and they they have, you know, their sets of, you know, goals and aspirations. And who are we to kind of stop them? Just listen. Don't throw money at them. You know, um, let them justify each and every one, but just listen to what they want. And, and every one of your kids is different. So the approach that you'll have with everyone is very different. So that's how I tackle it. I let, let a parent or a, or a counselor or anyone walk in. I listen to what they have to say. All the frustration comes out yeah. on the sponge. And then I give back tailored advice to what I think they want to hear, but in maybe the most subtle and best way possible that would also encourage the, the kid, you know? So, so listening and not throwing money at them, but maybe throwing money <laughs> at some of the, the worthy organizations that need funding. Listen before you throw money. Yeah, listen before you throw money. <laughs> okay. Invest. Please do invest in tomorrow's, you know, creatives. Sada, what about you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess uh, in light of cre creativity and the creative industries, and all, uh, I definitely see in our region or in the MENA region more support in the creative industries or in creative education. Right. But... I would encourage, um, you know, to, if we're talking about kids, I guess, we're, we're talking to you all as parents. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, is, is, to in, is to continue to support uh, creative education because yeah. um, there's so much potential, especially in, in our region. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's so much talent to be fostered. And uh, with that fostering of talent, a lot of amazing inventors and ideas mm -hmm. that can come out of this region. So there's, there's, a lot of potential still, and there's a lot of opportunity still. So I think, um, yeah, to continue to encourage the creative industry um, for it to be less taboo. And, and to be not the first thing that people cut off the balance book. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, it's, 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 I think now more than ever, is, it's almost as good as being a doctor. Well, I mean, you, 
you've all mentioned this need for hope, and I think it brings it. It's so important. Yeah, it's all the same. Yeah. yeah. Mohammed, what about you? I would say uh, don't wait for others to solve uh, the problems you are facing in your uh, communities. Uh, take the initiative and think out of the box because I believe youth are uh, creative and they will find inno innovative ways uh, to, f to solve some different uh, problems that they face. So now whenever I lose uh, any football match, I would go to the referee and I say, hey, referee, one day I'll replace you with my software. So <laughs> now they are more afraid. <laughs> I, I love that this all came from this time you were aggrieved of being offside when you went yes. offside. I mean, that's it. That's <laughs> I took it personally. <laughs> but, but taking initiative, that's, uh, that's, some, that's yeah, that's, that's great advice yes. too. And, and finally, um, Mariam, what, what would you say? Uh, I want to compliment all the answers and say, like, after listening, supporting, and also give, getting the solution from within, give spaces also. Create spaces within even your watch list, for example, to watch something created from the region. In addition to all the blockbusters, watch something that has been mm. done and made by, by directors and, and creatives from the region. Attend their, their shows and, and go see their pieces, interact with them, and the amazing in, in inventions also. Mm. Give spaces for these as well, in addition to all the other amazing things that exist in the world. Well, I mean, thank you. For, I mean, I think there was four pieces of advice are incredible. And I think the thing that really struck me about this, you're all actually engaged in these spaces in what you do. And you've all mentioned it in some way or another about creating communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, for me, one of the biggest takeaways I've heard from this. Uh, you know, this creativity is one of the glues that helps people come together and sustain groups of people. <coughs> uh, and, and as you mentioned, give hope, but also give uh, prospects for the future. So I, I hope everyone can join me in, in thanking our incredible panelists uh, and our inspiring panelists. And hopefully you'll go away with not just having learned something, but maybe being inspired uh, to do something new. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.